Hello, and a very warm welcome to a virtual Clare College for Digital Gala Week with our guest, Jean Hanf Korolitz, who's joining us all the way from New York State in America. My name's Katie Astley, and I'm the Interim Deputy Development Director at Clare. Before I introduce Jean properly, uh, I've just got a couple of items of housekeeping to run through. The first is to inform you that this session is being recorded. Um, so uh, that means it will be available for general um, review and sharing tomorrow. The link will be available on our website from tomorrow morning. So please do go and have a look and share it with anybody else that you think might be interested to hear Jean's talk and reading. Secondly, we will be allowing plenty of time for questions at the end of the session. So um, as Jean talks and then as she reads the excerpt from her book, please do feel free to submit questions using the chat function below. And I will then rejoin at the end of the session and um, pass those questions through to Jean. So we should be able to have some really interesting um, discussion from that. We've had some really good sessions so far as part of this week. So please do feel free to submit questions as they arise in your head as we go. It's particularly um, exciting to be able to welcome an inter another international guest um, while we're all so far away from Claire um, and we, you know, it's so difficult to travel to the college at the moment. So just to say again, I said this at the beginning of every session, but it does feel like a very special gala week this week in terms of being able to bring Claire to you during these difficult times. So thank you for being with us. So Jean, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce you and thank you again for giving up your um, time and your, not your evening, your afternoon um, to join us today. So tonight you'll be reading to us from your latest novel, The Plot. Jean was raised uh, in New York City and she's not very far away from there now. She, un she attended Dartmouth College as an undergraduate before coming to Clare College in 1983 to study English as a postgraduate. Since then, Jean has achieved great success and prominence in her career as a writer and author. Her novel, The Admission, was adapted in 2013 as a film of the same name. And I, like many million viewers, was absolutely glued last year to The Undoing uh, on HBO, starring Nicole Kidman and Hugh Grant, which was adapted from Jean's 2014 novel, You Should Have Known. Mm. I probably should have known Jean, but I didn't, so. <laughs> In her latest novel, her sixth novel, The Plot, um, when a young writer dies before completing his first novel, his teacher Jake, who is himself a failed novelist, helps himself to the book's plot. The resulting book is a phenomenal success, but then Jake begins to receive messages from someone who claims to know what he did, dot, dot, dot. I'll hand over to you from there, Jean. Oh, great. Okay, well, thank you so much for inviting me. And, you know, they say, you you're not, you're not a success till they ask you back to your alma mater. So I, I was very grateful to hear from Claire. And I'm very grateful to Claire for a lot of reasons, some of which I'm going to uh, just say a word about before um, I, I get into the plot. The plot. Um, I, I got to Claire because I was finishing up my undergraduate uh, degree at Dartmouth College, um, which is a very good college in America, but it's a liberal arts college. and um, that means many wonderful things, but it also means that whatever you're studying, you know less about it than an incoming first year student at a British university. So I knew I knew that there was a lot that I didn't know about um, English literature and I wanted to know more. Um, so I wanted to continue studying, but at the same time, I was pretty sure I wasn't going to end up in academia. And in those days before the internet, when dinosaurs uh, roamed the earth, the way you did a thing like this was you wrote a lot of letters. And I wrote letters to, I don't know, maybe half a dozen Cambridge colleges, including Claire. And the ones who responded to me, which was not all of them, but the ones who responded to me said things like, you know, you have to be at the top of your class and you have to be recommended by your department head and all sorts of things that I, I knew I wasn't going to be. Uh, and then I got a letter from Claire and uh, from the director of studies of English at Claire. And he said, he seemed to be very interested in the fact that I wrote poetry, which I did. I was quite serious um, in the writing of poetry at that time. Um, and so I thought, okay, you know, this sounds like, you know, a, a possibility. And so I wrote back to him, we began to correspond and I ended up at Claire. And I'm, I'm very glad that I did. 
So when I got there, I, I did find that I knew nothing. <laughs> I knew absolutely nothing about my field. You know, I, I, Beowulf to Virginia Woolf, I, 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 modern Icelandic. I mean, these are all things that had, had not really been a part of, of what I knew. And I, and I quickly found my way to an area of English literature I was especially interested in, which was 18th century fiction. Um, but I, I want to tell you about two things that happened during my, my couple of years at Claire, which really had a kind of a direct impact on me and, and, and led directly to the writing of well, all my novels, but this novel in particular. Uh, the first was something that happened in the fall of 1983, and I'd just been in Claire for a few months. And again, in those pre-internet times, the way you heard news was not you know, on your phone or on Twitter or Instagram or whatever. It was a kind of rumble. You heard this rumble. Uh, of, of, of news. In my case, the news, the rumble came from letters I was getting from friends in America. People were very upset about a particular essay that had been published in a literary magazine, the Kenyan Review, um, by a poet uh, named Donald Hall. And this, uh, this poet was very upset about uh, the rise of the MFA program, the Master of Fine Arts programs uh, in America. And, and the plot actually features a master fine arts program. Um, these programs were new in America. They were instantly ubiquitous. They were like mushrooms across the academic landscape. And, and there were good reasons for that. I mean, they were inexpensive to run. They were lucrative to run. Um, and they were turning out kind of hordes of young writers, young and not so young writers. Um, and what Donald Hall was arguing in his essay what, uh, which was upsetting so many people, was that these programs were terrific at producing pretty good poets. He didn't take on the fiction writers, he was more interested in the poets. Um, and the problem with all of these pretty good poets was that it made it that much harder uh, to find the one or two poets in every generation that were Keats. <laughs> and therefore, with those people who were not Keats, please stop writing. <laughs> so you can understand why people were very, very unhappy about this, this essay. Um, because everybody thinks they're Keats, um, except for me. When I read the essay, I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm Keats. And I think maybe I should stop. Um, I didn't stop right away. I actually wrote many poems in those two years. And and I did publish a book of poems with a great British uh, publisher called Blood Axe Books. Uh, but I think that experience was a turning point for me because I, deep down I knew that for me, fiction was really it. And I was scared to write fiction. I was really afraid to write fiction. And it was a few more years before I would get over that. And in the meantime, I wrote poetry and poetry was um, an important first step for me. But I think from that, moment, I, my goal was somewhat reoriented. And, you know, footnote, a couple of years later, I did meet Keats um, and I married him. So, I mean, I, I, I could see the difference between what my, my future husband was doing in terms of his work in poetry. Um, that was a very stark contrast to what I was doing. So um, that turned out to be the right thing for me. The other thing um, that I want to mention was a lecture that I attended at Cambridge, probably a few months after the Keats uh, incident. Um, and it was ironically a lecture not by a, a Cambridge faculty member, but by a visiting Oxford Don named Oliver Taplin. And it was, uh, it was a, a lecture on uh, Greek drama, which was not a subject I was especially interested in. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I was there, why I was there, to tell you the truth, but, uh, but it changed my life. And this lecture was about the structure of the play Oedipus Rex. And the way uh, Taplin described the play made me think very deeply about what plot was and why it was important. And he pointed out something that you know ought to be obvious, but to me it wasn't, which was that uh, Oedipus Rex is, in addition to all the other things it is, a great whodunit, maybe the greatest whodunit ever written. It begins with, Oedipus, the king, trying to find the culprit who has committed the crime uh, that has brought such terrible repercussions on the city of Thebes. And uh, even as he asks, who did it? 
his destiny is to answer that question as I did it. And in that question and that answer lies the heart of every great thriller. Um, and I could talk about that for a long time and I have written about it extensively, but I, I don't wanna take up too much time here, but I, but I wanna say that that lecture again oriented me um, towards plot in a way that I had not considered until then. And, you know, I, the transition from poetry to fiction was kind, of, was kind of enormous enough, but to go within fiction from kind of beautifully written, artistically, you know, uh, generated uh, literature to something with the kind of tawdry element, as I thought of it then, of plot was kind of a bridge too far at the time. But gradually over the years, I have, uh, I have more and more embraced the idea of plot, the necessity of plot, the beauty of plot, the artistry of plot. And that is how, you know, you end up many years later with a novel called The Plot. This, by the way, is the English, uh, sorry, the American cover. It's a super cool cover, but I have to say, I love the British cover. The British cover is coming out, I think, within the month. So I've been very uh, graced with covers for this, for this book. So as Katie said, um, this is a novel about a writer who uh, is a kind of a failed writer and he is teaching in an MFA program, but not even a very good MFA program, a pretty bottom of the barrel MFA program. Now we have this thing called low residency programs, which are, are held on college campuses and you go for a couple of weeks a year and the rest of the time you're emailing with your classmates and your uh, teacher and uh, that is the kind of program that this protagonist, his name is Jake, is teaching in. Um, he is a writer who's had a tiny, teeny, tiny little bit of success with his first novel um, and uh, none with his second, and now he's just stuck. I, I, I tend not to use the phrase writer's block because I don't think it exists, but <laughs> that's just me. Um, so in this excerpt, um, something he's he has this encounter with this horrible arrogant student whose name is evan parker but he's so arrogant and so sure of his imminent fame that he has announced to the class that he's going to change his name for privacy to parker evan <laughs> and and that is relevant in this uh, excerpt so um a year or two or I believe three actually after the encounter between this teacher and the student in which the student reluctantly uh, tells Jake the story of his sure to be a bestseller book um, which Jake actually agrees with it you know the, the, the story that he hears in his office at this uh, creative writing program is so brilliant that he actually comes to believe that this kind of massive jerk of a student is going to have a huge success and there's just nothing that anybody can do about that. It's it's going to be just about as big as Evan Parker, Parker Evan, <laughs> uh, claims it's going to be. So a few years have passed and something has reminded Jake of this person. He hasn't thought about him in a while and he realizes he's never seen this book. Where is this book that uh, that he heard the story of way back at in the program. And he decides to go and see what happened. You know, maybe, maybe it was too much for this guy. Maybe he bit off more than he could chew. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I have a great novel in me, but they never actually write it. So that's sort of where we are. And uh, this moment expands into a huge crossroad for, um, for Jake when he makes a very fateful decision. So I'm gonna take a little sip of water and I will begin. Oh, there's one thing I did wanna say. There's, I don't know if you have this in the UK, there's something called spin art. Um, you know, we saw it in a lot of kind of festivals and, and uh, carnivals and things like that, especially in the 1960s and 70s, there's a spinning wheel and you, and you drop some color on it and it spins around. It was very groovy and psychedelic. So there's a reference to that. That's what that means. Okay. Late that night, he did something he had never done. Not once since he'd watched his fortunate student walk into the grove of trees on the Ripley campus. And by the way, it is not a mistake that this college uh, is called Ripley. Just saying. You know. 
any connection to uh, Patricia Highsmith is entirely uh, coincidental. <laughs> At his computer, Jake typed in the name Parker Evan and clicked return. Parker Evan wasn't there, which meant not much. Parker Evan had been his former student's intended pen name at one point, but that point had been three years earlier. Maybe he'd decided on another name, either because switching his own actual name around was a dumb idea, or because he'd opted for even more privacy from the infinity of other possibilities. Jake went back to the search field and typed Parker Novel Thriller. Parker Novel Thriller returned pages of references to Donald Westlake's Parker novels and also another series of mysteries by Robert B. Parker. So even if Evan Parker had gotten his book all the way to a publisher, the first thing they'd probably have done was instruct him to drop Parker as a pen name. Jake removed the name from his search field and tried Thriller Mother Daughter. It was an onslaught, pages and pages of books by pages and pages of writers, most of whom he'd never even heard of. Jake ran his eye down the entries, reading the brief descriptions, but there was nothing that fit the very specific elements of the story his student had told him back at Ripley. He clicked on some random author names, not really expecting to find an image of Evan Parker's only half-remembered face, but there was nothing even remotely like it. Old men, fat men, bald men, and plenty of women. He wasn't here. His book wasn't here. Could Evan Parker have been wrong? Could he, Jake, also have been wrong all this time? Could that plot simply have disappeared into a sea of stories, novels, thrillers, and mysteries published each year and sunk into silence? Jake thought not. It seemed more likely that despite his boundless faith in himself, Parker had somehow not managed to finish his book at all. Maybe the book wasn't here on his computer, comfortably ensconced in the first page of each and every one of his search results, because it wasn't anywhere. It wasn't in the world at all, but why? Jake typed the name, the real name, Evan Parker, into the search field. More than a few Facebook Evan Parkers appeared in the search results. Jake clicked over to Facebook and ran his eye down the list. He saw more men, bigger, slighter, bolder, darker, but no one remotely like his former student. Maybe Evan wasn't on Facebook. Jake himself wasn't on Facebook. He'd quit when it became too demoralizing to see his friends posting news about their forthcoming books. He returned to the search results and clicked images and scanned the page and then the next page. So many Evan Parkers, none of them his. He clicked back to the all results page. There were Evan Parkers who were high school soccer players, ballet dancers, career diplomats stationed in Chad, racehorses and engaged couples. The future Evan Parkers welcome you to our wedding site. There was no male, no male human, even vaguely his former student's age, who looked anything like the Evan Parker Jake had known at Ripley. Then he saw at the bottom of the page, searches related to Evan Parker. And below that, the words Evan Parker obituary. Even before his cursor found the link, he knew what he would see. Evan Luke Parker of West Rutland, Vermont, had died unexpectedly on the evening of October 4th, 2013. Evan Luke Parker had been a 1995 graduate of West Rutland High School, had attended classes at Rutland Community College, and was a lifelong resident of Central Vermont. Predeceased by both parents and a sister, he was survived by a niece. Memorial services were to be announced at a future time. Burial would be private. Jake read through it twice. There wasn't much to it, really, but it refused to punch its way through, even so. He was dead. He was dead. And Jake looked now at the date. This had not happened recently, either. This had happened incredibly. It had happened only a couple of months after their own doomed attempt at a student-teacher relationship. Jake hadn't even realized that Evan was a Vermonter or that his parents and sister were already dead, which was very tragic in light of the fact that he was fairly young himself. Not one of these things had ever come up in conversation between them, of course. They'd had no conversation, really, about anything else but Evan Parker's remarkable novel in progress, and even that, not much. For the rest of the Ripley session, in fact, his student had been downright reticent in workshop, and he had declined or not turned up for the remaining one-on-one -on -one conferences. Jake had even wondered if Parker regretted sharing his extraordinary novel idea with his teacher. But he himself never let on that he'd been told anything 
about what Parker was working on or that he thought it was at all out of the ordinary. When the session ended, this pompous, withholding, and profoundly irritating person had simply gone away, presumably to do what he needed to do in order to bring his book to the light, but actually just to die. Now he was gone, and his book, in all likelihood, unwritten. Later, of course, Jake would go back to this moment. Later, he would recognize it for the crossroads it was, but already he was wrapping this stark years after the fact set of circumstances in the first of what would be many layers of rationalization. Those layers had not much at all to do with the fact that Jake was a moral human being with presumably a code of ethical conduct. Mainly, they had to do with the fact that he was a writer, and being a writer meant another allegiance to something of even higher value, which was the story itself. Jake didn't believe in much. He didn't believe that any god had made the universe, let alone that said god was still watching the goings-on and keeping track of every human act, all for the purpose of assigning a few millennia of homo sapiens to a pleasant or an unpleasant afterlife. He didn't believe in an afterlife. He didn't believe in destiny, fate, luck, or the power of positive thinking. He didn't believe that we get what we deserve or that everything happens for a reason. What reason would that be? Or that supernatural forces impacted anything in a human life. What was left after all that nonsense? The sheer randomness of the circumstances we are born into, the genes we've been dealt, our varying degrees of willingness to work our asses off, and the wit we may or may not possess to recognize an opportunity should it arise. But there was one thing he actually did believe in that bordered on the magical, or at least the beyond pedestrian, and that was the duty a writer owed to a story. Stories, of course, are common as dirt. Everyone has one, if not an infinity of them, and they surround us at all times, whether we acknowledge them or not. Stories are the wells we dip into to be reminded of who we are and the ways we reassure ourselves that however obscure we may appear to others, we are actually important, even crucial, to the ongoing drama of survival, personal, societal, even as a species. But stories, despite all that, are also maddeningly elusive. There is no deep mine of them to blast around in or a big box store with wide aisles of unused, undreamed of, and thrillingly new narratives for a writer to push a big empty shopping cart through, waiting for something to catch their eyes. Every now and then, though, some magical spark flew up out of nowhere and landed in the consciousness of a person capable of bringing it to life. This was occasionally called inspiration though inspiration was not a word writers themselves often used. These magical little sparks tended not to waste time in declaring themselves. They woke you up in the mornings with an annoying tap-tap and a sense of unfolding urgency, and they hounded you through the days that followed. The idea, the characters, the problem, the setting, the lines of dialogue, descriptive phrases, and opening sentence. To Jake, the word that comprised the relationship between a writer and their spark was responsibility. Once you were in possession of an actual idea, you owed it a debt for having chosen you and not some other writer. And you paid that debt by getting down to work, not just as a journeyman fabricator of sentences, but as an unshrinking artist ready to make painful, time-consuming, even self-flagellating mistakes. Rising to this responsibility was a matter of facing your blank page or screen and muzzling the critics inside your head at least long enough for you to get some work done. All of which was profoundly difficult and none of which was optional. What's more, you stepped away from it at your peril because if you failed in this grave responsibility, you might well find after some period of distraction or even less than fully committed work that your precious spark had left you gone, in other words, as suddenly and unexpectedly as it had appeared, and your novel along with it, though you might spin your wheels for a few months or a few years or the rest of your life, hopelessly throwing words onto the page or screen in a stubborn refusal to face what had happened. And there was something else, an extra dark superstition for any writer hubristic enough to ignore the spark of a great idea. Even if that writer was not of a religious bent, even if he did not believe that 
everything happens for a reason, even if indeed he resisted magical thinking of every other conceivable kind. The superstition held that if you did not do right by the magnificent idea that had chosen you among all possible writers to bring to life, that great idea didn't just leave you to spin your stupid and ineffectual wheels, it actually went to somebody else. A great story, in other words, wanted to be told. And if you weren't going to tell it, it was out of here. It was going to find another writer who would, and you would be reduced to watching somebody else write and publish your book. Intolerable. Once, long ago, Jake had done his best to honor what he'd been given. He had recognized his spark and done right by it, never shirking the hard thinking and the careful writing, pushing himself to do well and then to do better. He had pursued no shortcuts and evaded no effort. He had taken his chance against the world, submitting himself to the opinions of publishers, reviewers, and ordinary readers. But favor had passed over him and moved on to others. What was he to do? Who was he to be? if no other spark ever came to him again. It was unbearable to contemplate. Good writers borrow, great writers steal, Jake was thinking. That ubiquitous phrase was attributed to T.S. Eliot, which didn't mean Eliot himself hadn't stolen it. But Eliot had been talking perhaps less than seriously about the theft of actual language, phrases and sentences and paragraphs, not of a story itself. Besides, Jake knew, as Eliot had known, as all artists ought to know, that every story, like every single work of art, from the cave paintings to whatever was playing at the Park Theater in Cobleskill, to his own puny books, was in conversation with every other work of art, bouncing against its predecessors, drawing from its contemporaries, harmonizing with the patterns, all of it the paintings and choreography and poetry and photography and performance art and the ever fluctuating novel was whirling away in an unstoppable spin art machine of its own. And that was a beautiful, thrilling thing. He would hardly be the first to take some tale from a play or a book, in this case, a book that had never been written and create something entirely new from it. Miss Saigon from Madam Butterfly, The Hours from Mrs. Dalloway, the Lion King from Hamlet, for goodness sake. It wasn't even taboo, and obviously it wasn't theft. Even if Parker's manuscript actually existed at the time of his death, Jake had never seen more than a couple of pages of the thing, but he remembered little of what he had seen. Surely what he himself might make from so little would belong to him and only to him. These, then, were the circumstances in which Jake found himself that January evening at his computer in his cruddy Cobleskill apartment in the leather stocking region of upstate New York, out of pride, hope, time, and he could finally admit ideas of his own. He hadn't gone looking for this. He had upheld the honor of writers who listened to the ideas of other writers and then turned responsibly back to their own. He had absolutely, absolutely not invited the brilliant spark his student had abandoned okay, and voluntarily abandoned to come to him, but come it had. And here it was, this urgent shimmering thing already tap tapping in his head, already hounding him, the idea, the characters, the problem. So what was Jake supposed to do about that? A rhetorical question, obviously. He knew exactly what he was going to do. So that's the excerpt. Hey, Katie. Hi. <laughs> so you said that you said that it's coming out in England very soon. I think so. And, you know, people are already sort of posting about reading it. And I'm with the English cover and I'm not sure why that is. It, uh, maybe Favors has uh, released some early digital editions or something. But I, I think it's in August that it comes out. Because yeah, I have to say, I had a look online today at a well-known online bookstore, and it was already it was available. But oh, that was pre or whether that was pre-order, I'm not sure. But yeah, Kindle version and um, Audible as well. So yeah, great, it's on its way. <laughs> One burning question I have right at the beginning is: Do we find out as the reader what the plot is? 
or is it one of those ones yeah. where it's a no, secret you, name? <laughs> you, you do find out in the fullness of time. One of the things that I think people uh, ha have, have been liking about this book um, is the fact that the novel that Jake is about to start writing uh, actually becomes wildly successful, just as his late student predicted. Um, the novel is called Crib, which, as you know, is a word like plot. It's a word that has multiple, um, multiple definitions. And uh, crib, a place you put a baby, but also uh, an act of thievery. So uh, we read excerpts of Jake's novel throughout the book, and each excerpt is uh, is a clue, really. Um, I don't mean a clue in in terms of a whodunit. I, I mean, Although it is a bit of a <laughs> this is a bit of, this is more of my genre problem, frankly. Um, but yes, you do, you will eventually find out. And I will say that even though there are there are a lot of big twists and reveals in this book, some very very astute readers of thrillers and mysteries have figured out one of these big twists before I was ready to tell them. But nobody has guessed the plot. And that's that that's that's quite exciting. So yeah. if you guess it, don't tell me I don't want to know. Like we like we all like a twist, right? <laughs> you, know, do. And, you know, there there aren't that many good ones. I I have to say I'm not very easily surprised. There is a British novel called Behind Her Eyes by Sarah Penborough, um, that was recently made into a television show. That was a plot that I did not. That was a that was a plot twist I did not see coming. But I can't quite decide whether it's brilliant or stupid. <laughs> so, I don't know. so I have some questions coming in, um, and the first one is, is actually kind of related to that. It's about the writing process itself, and I was interested when you were when you were first talking through it, um, in and and particularly when to say what you were just saying there about the layers upon layers of of the clues and the plot. Do you? In terms of the process itself, how much have you absolutely planned out every single part of the plot and all of those twists? And how much of it is is sort of grown organically as you write? Because yeah. uh, I know different writers have different approaches, but it seems to me with such a complex story. Yeah, you would think I knew in advance, but I didn't. Yeah, you didn't. So I didn't, I mean, in a way, I. It's probably a, be a better idea to, to say a little bit about how this book came to happen, mm. um, which will kind of then reveal um, the answer to that question. Uh, actually, can I ask, is that's another question that's come in is, is exactly that. It's because you, you said actually in your, um, you use the phrase that inspiration is not a word that yeah. writers themselves often use. So yeah. that, I guess that's, that is that question. So what was your inspiration? Where did it come from? Right. So I, I should start by saying that I, I have written novels that I literally thought about for 20 years before I wrote the first word. And even those novels, I, I didn't know everything that was going to happen, but it took a long time for an idea, kind of a problem, a what if question to bubble up to the 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 point that I felt I had something that only I could say. Um, but twice in my writing life, I have been walloped by an idea that just came out of nowhere. The first time it happened was You Should Have Known, which became The Undoing, which, by the way, thanks for the praise of The Undoing, which I totally don't deserve. But the book and the TV show were very, very different. Um, the book was not a whodunit. There was no, you know, uh, there was no trial. There was no lawyer. Um, it was really a very internal novel about this character that Nicole Kidman ended up playing. Um, I, I loved it, but I didn't know who did it when I watched it. No idea who did it. Um, <laughs> it was kind of uh, embarrassing. People were calling me and saying, look, who did it? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, so that was the first time this happened. The second time was with the plot, but the circumstances were very strange. Um, I had been working on another novel, a very different novel, for about two years, and I was, I was uh, having some difficulty getting my editor to buy this book. In fact, she had kind of turned it down twice, and I was in her office. This was January of 2020. Um, having a very painful meeting in which uh, she was explaining to me why she wasn't buying the book yet. I mean, she wasn't not buying it ever. She wanted another revision. And I was exhausted with this novel. I'd been working on it for so long. I had no more ideas. I was tapped out. 
And um, I was also, you know, it's neither here nor there, but I was also very, very upset about something I was reading about that was happening in Wuhan, China, involving a virus. And I was the only person I knew who was as upset about this as I was. I was full of doomsday scenarios. I was <laughs> telling everybody, this is like the stand, you know, we're in the first chapters of the stand. Anyway, I was not in great shape and I was having this um, very painful meeting with my beloved editor who, you know, even then I didn't think was motivated by anything but wanting the book to be as good as it could be. Um, and in the middle of this meeting, I kind of heard myself say to her, but wait, I have this other idea. And I barely had the idea, but what I, what little I had was so powerful that it was like that you should have known moment. Um, and I start telling her this story about this writer who steals an idea, or I shouldn't say steals, but who appropriates an idea from his late student. And then I told her what the idea was. I told her what the plot was and her, like her, her mouth fell off. And it was, it was so gratifying. I, I mean, I left the meeting thinking, um, Okay, so you know, my my career isn't over right now, even if we're not all wiped out by this thing from Wuhan, China that I'm reading about. Um, you know, I, I will write again. And the next day, my uh, agent called me and she said, "What the hell just happened? I mean, you you went into that meeting unable to sell one novel, and we're we're gonna we just sold two novels." So I had been given this incredible gift of um, belief, frankly, you know, belief in my future as a writer, but also it was even more of a gift because the decision that my editor and I made together was, we're gonna put down the big novel, which you clearly need a break from, and you're gonna write this other thing, which really is such a kind of propulsive and compelling story. It's clear that it wants to be written now. And then, everything shut down and suddenly I was in a very remote place, not far from the Cobleskill, New York mentioned in that excerpt. Um, and all I, all I could do was write this book. I didn't wanna read the paper. I didn't wanna watch the news. I was terrified <laughs> by what was happening in the world, but I had work and I had a deadline and I had a project and I had this really compulsive need to get up in the morning and work all day. And that's what I did. So for four months, all I did was write this book and then it was done, which is crazy. I mean, if somebody tells you, oh, I wrote a novel in four months, don't read that novel. You know, it's probably not gonna be very good. In this case, it was, it, it, you know, it was four months plus 25 years of writing novels that got, that made this novel such a, such a rapid thing. So, um, in terms of the process for this book, write like a maniac all day and avoid the news. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I it was the most intense writing experience of my life, and I hope it never happens again, because you know what had to happen in the world for me to be able to write this was something I I I would never ever want to happen again. So it's really um, interesting to hear you say that though, because um, there's been such sort of different messages between people who've said that the pandemic was very good for the creative process and others who said it was really bad. And in some ways, I, I appreciate what you're saying about how, how intense and, and yeah. difficult it was in some ways, but in some ways I, I felt myself feeling rather envious that you had such, you had something to take you out of yourself and to focus yeah. upon during that time, because I think actually a lot of people would have, it would have helped a lot of people to have that during that period. Yeah, no, I, I was never not aware of that for a single day um yeah 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 it's it's amazing and i th i think um uh well a, a couple of other questions that are sort of bubbling up here both both on screen and, but also with me so if you'll bear with me the first question is related to that um in terms of the writing process and then and the inspiration side of it when you when you mention how every one of us has a novel inside of us uh, and obviously you were you were a talented writer you had creative even though you, you switched from poetry to to fiction and then into as you were saying the more sort of plot driven fiction so you obviously had that background and you had that that training but for those of us who maybe didn't have that what is your advice for how we go about 
not we as in me but how one would go about finding that novel within them and um well I think there's a difference between having a novel within you and having stories with you within mm, you uh, mm. many people think that writing a novel it must be super easy because we all speak we go to the grocery store we're speaking you know we're this we turn on the news we're listening you know language is something that we all deal with every day but when it comes to writing down language, um, you know, it's not it's not easy for everybody. It's not easy for even those of us who who have been doing it for a while and, and hope to keep doing it. So uh, somebody oh. somebody was uh, interviewing me said there that they've actually analyzed when people say, oh, I have a great idea for a novel that generally translates to four sentences. <laughs> Well, it's about this guy who's born in a pigsty and then he decides he's a sheepdog and how does he reconcile you know being born in a pigsty and wanting you get the rest. that's that's what most people have when they have their big idea um to build language and to create characters and to do all the things that we want from a novel is is a big big, big undertaking. And you know, there are plenty of things in the world that I can't do. And a lot of them I really wish I could. Um, but this is not a common skill. And uh, you know, it's, we, we may have the story, but we may not have the novel. However, if you have the story and you want to have the novel, the best thing that anybody can do is Read, 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 read. And you know, uh, the conventional wisdom, oh, right, you must write every day. I'm actually, I don't think that's true. I think there are a lot of people out there who are writing and they're journaling and, um, but they're not reading. <laughs> if you don't read, you can't write. It's just, you just can't. And I would, I would go even farther and encourage people to read bad books as well as good books. Um, you know, read the, read the great books, read, you know, read the books that have lasted for a good reason, and then read the crappy things too, because you know you need to know the difference. You need to recognize the difference. You said right at the beginning, you need to go from Beowulf to Virginia Woolf. <laughs> well, I that, love that. that. I love that. that. So Basically, exciting. everything, right? Everything. <laughs> that was how we in America were told that the British system worked. You start with Beowulf and you end at Virginia Woolf. Um, but in America, you you know, you'd get a class on Virginia Woolf and maybe you'd get a class on, you know, the, the rise of the novel. Maybe you'd get a class on the mystery novel. And, and it was this sort of patchwork thing. And we didn't know anything. And we, you know, we would get to, to Cambridge and you would meet students who were in our classes who were four years younger than us and who were just brilliant thing to like they knew everything and and you'd go my god you know my expensive education what was it but of course you know it was a different animal is what it was it was it was social sciences and it was you know hard sciences and it was literature and it was a lot it was a it was a great i mean the best thing you can possibly do if you have six years to get educated is to do both mm. um, it was very good for me um just a call out to the audience if if anyone has any more questions please do submit them in the chat function now um i have another one of my own if i may um i've been lucky enough to be a member of a book the same book club for 10 years now and so we've read about 100 books um, and one of the things that we've noticed in our wide range of of reading materials some very good some very bad <laughs> is that a lot of novels actually feature writers as protagonists um, and we've theorized about this a bit in terms of is that because of this sort of thing of you write what you know and there is there there is that sense of if, if you're a writer then maybe connecting with with somebody who works in a similar field and that's why that's the case I, I'm interested in this book because obviously the protagonist there's multiple writers involved but you've written other books where that's not the case. Mm. Um, so I just wondered if that was something that you did consciously, if that's something that you found easier to write about writers because you share that experience or indeed yeah. was it actually harder because it was so, they were obviously very different because I'm sure you would not be yeah, I'm doing so the same thing. I'm so glad you asked this question because you know, all through the writing of this book, I had this, you know, one of my many chorus of critics in my head uh, was saying, you're not supposed to write about writers. You know, the conventional wisdom is readers don't want to read about writers. Oh, lo but loads of people re write about well, writers. This is what I've discovered. But, you know, all through it's like, you know, it's so myopic. It's so self-obsessed. Self um, 
Uh, but I was doing it anyway, because I think, you know, we writers, we are a strange breed and uh, we're so lucky because, you know, we get to go to work in our pajamas and that's a great thing. Um, but we have certain preoccupations that may not really translate to to the rest of the, the population. One of our preoccupations is all issues around appropriation and plagiarism. Um, I, I have a personal reading list of books about plagiarism. I will read anything about plagiarism. I'll read anything about writers. Um, but I think our, our fixation on this subject uh, is due to the fact that we have a deep fear, <laughs> deep down, that uh, we are doing it, that we are plagiarizing. And the reason, you know, you'd think, uh, you know, this sentence, if, if somebody wrote it before I did, you'd think I would recognize that. But in fact, you know, to go back to the fact that, that, that writers are readers, most of us have been at it a long time. Like we were books under the covers with the flashlight people. And there are hundreds or thousands of books in there, uh, remembered, half remembered, half forgotten, misremembered, that are all jostling around together. And sometimes when we write, we don't entirely trust where that came from, where that sentence came from, where that character came from, where that story came from. And it's very unsettling because to plagiarize is to be a vile, evil criminal, and you should go to hell and be boiled in oil. I mean, this is, this is, we understand this. However, to take a story that has been told before and tell it again is also appropriation, but it's not the same. And I myself have, have adapted stories in my work. I mean, that novel that I thought about for 20 years before I wrote a word uh, was based on the Strauss opera Der Rosen Cavalier, which I first encountered when I was at Cambridge. I thought about it for 20 years, and then I wrote a novel in which the plot of Der Rosen Cavalier uh, had moved to New York City in the 1990s. I mean, the, 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 the opera takes place in the 18th century, and everybody was Jewish. <laughs> and I was saying something different but I was repurposing that story. I wrote another novel, The Sabbath Day River, which was largely based on Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter. You know, and, and those, those uh, examples that were quoted in the book, uh, Charles Fraser and Ulysses, uh, Jane Smiley and, a, and uh, a Thousand Acres. I mean, this is not a bad thing. This is a good thing to take a story, to think about it so deeply that, it spins off in a different direction. And yet, even though we writers understand this, and many readers do as well, um, not everybody does. And the accusatory climate that we are in right now doesn't help either. So all that has to happen um, is for somebody to be accused of plagiarism, and that sticks to them for the rest of their lives. And that is what Jake fears, and it's what I fear. Um, I get asked many times, and this is slightly off topic from what you originally asked, but I've been asked many times, why is what Jake did wrong? Or was it wrong? Or would you do what he did? And the answer is, it's not wrong, but I wouldn't do it. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't refrain from doing what he did because it was wrong. I would refrain from doing what he did because I fear the condemnation. Um, to be accused of stealing somebody else's work, whether it's the story, the idea, the character, the sentence, whatever, is so devastating that I couldn't bear it. Was his crime therefore just not that he wasn't transparent about the fact that it wasn't his original idea? I don't think it was a crime. I, I don't think what he did was wrong. Mm -hmm. I but, mean, I, I think I said what you were saying then about the, um, the repurposing of stories I think that's that's something I talk to my kids about a lot you know I tell them something is a classic if it can be retold and repurposed and you know 
something like the Christmas Carol, you can tell it in a million different ways. And the Muppet Christmas Carol is entirely logical. And it, it, speaks, really, it, speaks, really it, speak, it speaks to the fact that it's a classic in yes. that nobody owns it anymore. It's yes. so classic that it's yes. entered public consciousness. And there's yes. lots of examples of, of music and books and stories like that. Um, so in some ways, it's the highest form of, of attainment, isn't it, for a story to get to that point where it can be freely plagiarized but there's that sort of intermediary intermediate point where it's not quite so clear cut well when it gets to language it's it's totally verboten it's you you just don't do that but it's interestingly and rather depressingly i must say since this book came out in america i have been keeping track of all of the different things books tv shows movies that i supposedly stole from right. the you know, so like somebody said, oh, she took this plot from name of TV show I've never heard of, or, you know, little pieces of it, like the writer who, who, who doesn't, who's stuck, who doesn't have a new book, that came from such and such. So this is the kind of, this is the way, you know, in a way it's understandable because we're seeing the patterns, we're seeing those works of art in conversation with one another. I did not make up the character of a writer who can't write a book. This has been around for a long time. I'm not saying I invented it, um, but it's depressing too, because you know you feel wounded that somebody thinks you took somebody else's work. Um, and you know you wanna to respond to these people and of course you can't do that. But at some point when I, when I have enough of a list, I'm gonna write something about how meta- but, and but I love the fact that your, the novel itself is a commentary on that fact. It so, is. Um, it and is. I, I think that again, is something that I mean, this sort of thing my, my book club would absolutely love because it's that layer of conversation about what's right and wrong. What does that mean in terms of the writer's career and the writer's choices? And I think that's, you know, that's just such a, there is no right answer, but it's... it's... Well, just look at it this way. I mean, J.K. Rowling wrote thousands and thousands of pages. She created an, an entire universe of alternate reality that... Uh, obsessed and entertained and diverted us for, I don't know, 15 years. She's been accused of plagiarism because some lady in, I think in Pennsylvania, self-published a children's book called Harry and the Muggles, right? Which she'd never seen. So now, you know, you want to Google a list of writers who've been accused of plagiarism. J.K. Rowling is on that list. Yeah. She didn't do anything wrong, but no. that, you know, that taint, is you know it it's not fair it's not right but but you know like i'm friends with joyce carol oates and joyce carol oates and stephen king were also accused of plagiarism by the same crazy woman who accused them i believe of breaking into their breaking into her home and photographing the papers on her desk so you know newsflash Stephen King does not need to break into your home and photograph the papers on your desk, and neither does Joyce Carol Oates, but they're, those two names are now on that same list. Well, it's so, a mark of honor to be on that list then, right? Well, <laughs> as, as, as the editor says to Jake, you know, this because finally the accusation of, of uh, plagiarism is you know, gets through to the publisher and they try to reassure him, oh, you know, everybody gets this. But, you know, he's not happy about it and I wouldn't be happy about it either. Well, thank you so much, Jean. It's been fascinating talking to you and, and thank you for accepting such a wide range of questions. I hope you didn't, didn't mind me delving into some Not quite personal all. areas there. It was a lot of fun. Um, like I said, we writers, were, <laughs> this is what we talk about all day. It's what we obsess about. So. But some real insights into the process and, you know, the plot development and indeed the, the sort of issues that you're grappling with in your, pers in, per in your professional life. So thank you so much for sharing thank such you. a, such a wide me. range with us. Thank um, you, Claire. Thank you for admitting thank me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you too to our audience tonight. We're just going to finally put up a slide for you so that you can see... Um, what what Jean's book is so that we you can go and find it for yourselves in, in all good bookshops very soon if if not already if you're in the states um and thank you so much for being here tonight and uh we look forward to welcoming you back to Claire soon oh, I would love that. <laughs> okay, bye, thank you bye-bye